The Wellness Show, episode 211. Welcome to The Wellness Show, a podcast on health and wealth. I'm your host, Tyson Bannigan, the founder of the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy. Join me as we get the latest insight, tips, and strategies from wellness providers, coaches, and successful heart-centered entrepreneurs, and much, much more. show and we have another exciting show every show is exciting because i get to talk to the most awesome people on the planet and today we're going to be talking with rick titan he's a former uh, wrestling superstar and now a transformational speaker and coach and the topic today which is really really interesting is the tibetan steps to crush stress who doesn't have stress in their life this is a very busy time on planet Earth. Everybody seems to be overwhelmed. So I'd like to write, come you, welcome you, Rick, to the show. Welcome Thank to the you show. Much, Jason. I'm happy to be here. Yes. Yeah, so um, it must have been quite a transformation for you to uh, give up the wrestling show and all that publicity and people knowing who you were and what you were doing and all of that. So let me know a little bit about that for the listeners. What, 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 what was that world like? Well, it, it started with uh, the spirituality started when I hit, much like the Buddha, the age of 29. Um, but I'll roll back to, I was doing martial arts when I was about 15, 16 years old. And I was watching wrestling on TV and I was already about six foot five. And I've been working out, believe it or not, since I was eight years old. I had my first uh, sand filled set of weights, plastic weights back then and would follow Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno and the Incredible Hulk on TV. and. Conan the Barbarian, and I wanted to be like them. And um, it was just an odd personal drive. And nowadays, we have a lot more teenagers going to gyms. When I was growing up, you didn't see teenagers in gyms. And by the time I was a teen, I got a gym membership. There were only adults in there, and that was uh, – it was odd at the time, you know. And then I watched that on TV, and I was going to school. And I thought, I can't sit down at a desk. I couldn't sit still. And I knew I had to do something physical and something really active. And I love being around people. I was a bit of a ham ever since I was a, a really young kid. So I thought, yeah, I could do that. And um, pretty much everybody else thought it was ridiculous and I was out of my mind. But I asked around and tried to find, I was living in Vancouver at the time. I'm in Calgary, Alberta, Canada right now. Um, to find a fellow who had been doing some of this wrestling and the local wrestling shows it was very political, a lot of them, you know, the people who are the world heavyweight champions are usually the owner of the company or the owner's friend or something like that. And these guys were, were not the fittest guys in the world. And um, in my opinion, I thought a lot of what they were doing looked really, really phony. So I knew from my martial arts background, we were doing point sparring. And I thought, well, I can make this look as good or, or better than the guys that were in the World Wrestling Federation at the time. So that's how, kind of how my whole journey started. Well, so you brought a whole new perspective to wrestling then. In a sense, um, there are other guys like Brett the Hitman Hart and other martial artists that did really well. Uh, there's there's a few different qualities though that you would need. One, you would need charisma in front of an audience. And there's some great wrestlers and great fighters who didn't have much charisma. They were really internal. Um, and so you had to be able to have that energy to give out to the audience. So that was another big part of it. And fortunately, I had some. And uh, with the martial arts, I ended up going to Japan after I moved to Calgary because Calgary Stampede Wrestling was really popular at the time. And Bret Hart, Owen Hart, British Bulldogs, all these guys were going from Calgary to the WWF, which is now World Wrestling Entertainment, WWE. And I thought, well, that's what I'm going to do. And again, once again, everyone thought I was crazy, you know. But in my mind, it was set. That's it. I'm doing it. And there's no way I'm going to fail. And it did take a couple of years uh, of a match a month or a match every two months to get into it. But eventually I got invited to go to Japan. So the martial arts actually really lended well out there. It's mandatory for them to take uh, kendo or judo or karate in junior high and high school. So there's an old saying Hulk Hogan had. He said down south, especially in the States, they don't know the difference between a wrist lock and a wrist watch. <laughs> But in Japan, you can't fake it there, and everything has to be semi, 
at least semi-contact. So it was pretty rough out there too. So that that's really what you were bringing though to wrestling was that semi-contact or that uh, believability because of your sparring techniques that you le learned in the martial arts. Did I get that right? Yeah, and I was I got I worked my way up to eventually 295 pounds. But when I was more around 275, 280, I was shooting guys into the corner and doing flying sidekicks about six feet in the air to their chin, and the audience was going through the roof over it. So it was it was pretty interesting being a super heavyweight, but doing junior heavyweight moves. Wow. So did so how what brought you out of the, that whole career? Was it was it an injury or did you have an aha? I know that the spiritual aspect of what we're going to talk about was sort of cooking in the background. Probably because you want went to Japan, that probably intensified it even more. But so, so what brought you on in? Well, I'd gone to Japan and actually went to some Shinto shrines where they would clap twice and ring a bell. And somehow um, I felt right at home doing that. And a lot of the other Americans and Canadians that went over there, they didn't have much interest in it. And I, I found that I had this sense of belonging there, maybe past lives or whatever you want to believe in. And mm -hmm. from there, um, the last two years of it, I was, because of the semi-contact style and landing on your back and neck constantly, it was five days a week or six days a week. Wow. Take, yeah, real pounding for, I did it for 10 years. And about eight years in, I got so stiff and so sore and aching from my ankles to my knees to my hips, headaches every day. I thought, well, I'm going to have to change my life here. I can't live like this forever. And right. it was also to the point of um, in the yoga philosophies, they call higher vibration sattvic, very high vibration. They say where the angels would vibrate at. And they would call the lower, heavy, more dense vibration rajasic. And I had a sense of that. So I'm surrounded in these locker rooms by guys that are vibrating at a rajasic level. And of course, I kind of had to vibrate at the same level to feel at place. And I also had this big, huge block. It felt like a steel block against other people because uh, it was very competitive. And sometimes it was just verbally abusive competitive, you know, from some of the other guys. And they always asked me to play a bad guy. I played a good guy once in a while. But uh, from the beginning, I always saw myself as a good guy. So then you've got fans booing you and a lot of anger and, um, I think the the whole industry, of course, breeds a lot of ego when you have people cheering for you, especially too. It's funny, the good guys got in worse moods than the bad guys because the fans were clamoring for them all the time. Right. And, and the bad guys out of the ring were a lot of times the nicer guys because they could just be left alone and, and kind of do their own thing. Um, but the last two years of it, I... I really thought, well, what can I do? Can I do acting? Well, I don't know if I'm that great of an actor and I'd probably have to be in Hollywood and I didn't know if I wanted to do that. And I thought, you know, the only, on my resume, all I'd be able to put on there is I can act and I can fight. So what kind yeah. of a job am I going to do? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I kept it up for the last two years and then I, I did have a heavyweight championship match in, in Osaka with a fellow named Shinya Hashimoto and he was going to, hook me around the head if I was looking that way and drop me back on my head for the finishing move to, to beat me for the heavyweight championship. And um, no surprise, it's predetermined. <laughs> and I thought, well, I didn't really like the idea of the DDT move. It didn't seem very powerful to me. So I thought, well, if he's going to do that and beat me with that move, I'm going to jump up really high and, and make it look like he killed me. Well, I, I'd kind of forgotten that he had a reputation for being what we called stiff or a crowbar. And he held on too tight. I jumped too high. I landed straight on the top of my head and cracked my C5, C6 vertebrae. Oh, yeah. yeah. So well, I did. Go ahead. Yeah, that was that would must have been horrific. Yeah, it was devastating. And I got a concussion from it, the first one ever. I didn't even know what it was, but I was so out of it after the match. Uh, reporters were coming up and asking me questions, and I was sort of sitting there and stunned. Uh, well, uh, I could barely talk and didn't know what was going on. Um, so that pretty much ended it. And it forced me to, to come back and live in Calgary and then try and figure out what I wanted to do next. So I did a few odd jobs here and there. Um, 
And I also knew that I wanted to change. I couldn't get along in relationships all the way through my 20s, uh, even male friendships. There was a lot of ego, and that happens for a lot of guys in their 20s anyways. But uh, I especially thought I was a pretty tough guy, and I was pretty cool. So <laughs> I wasn't the easiest to get along with and, and had a swollen head from all those fans cheering. Uh, they did yeah. cheer the moves a lot in Japan. They respected your ability versus the states you play a character if you play a bad guy you can do the best move in the world to still boo you and if you play a good guy then you're a good guy character even if you're a mediocre wrestler they still cheer them and japan's different so well that's that's interesting so here you are just doing wrestling and getting at it in a different way and you have to play the bad guy you got people booing at you you're trying to demonstrate that you know uh different techniques and everything and then you get yourself Hurt and all along in the background, you know that there's something bigger and better because you have this spiritual aha that's going on because of the martial arts, and uh, also the fact that you end up in Japan. You know that there's something bigger going on. Yet you have to play this game of being lesser than you are or smaller mm -hmm. to fit in. It sounds like a lot of people uh, in their life trying to fit into the status quo, whatever that is, whether it's wrestling or or or, or going to work or whatever, and I guess the lesson that you learn from that is don't fit in. I mean, and ultimately you can't fit in. You have to be yourself. Yeah, I think for certain certain jobs you have to take on the role while you're there um, just to do the job properly and, and even put up certain defenses if you're working with people who are unconscious right. and, and not very kind and don't know really know what compassion is. And you have to put on the shell and, and this – bravado and sort of toughness and things like that. I see this especially with women in society now because all of our roles are changing so much in the world these days and it is very confusing and then women carrying that into their personal life and private life and being really type A in a relationship, it's it's kind of sad to see in certain ways but it's also good because it's it liberates women more and uh, us men have become more gentle and more and more of us have become conscious. So after the, um, the rest, actually shortly before the wrestling career ended, uh, I stayed in one night and typically we would go out and all the guys would go out and drink and eat. And for some reason, I just wanted to stay in this one night in the hotel room and be alone. And I think that was the start of the journey, really. Uh, I had been meditating since I was 15 years old because of martial arts and I knew how to meditate. Um, but I was digging around the room, the hotel room, and I didn't know what I was looking for. I was searching through my bags and the dressers in the room and uh, pulled out the nightstand. And with the nightstand, there was a Bible, and then there was an orange book of the Buddha. And a lot of it made sense. I was raised Catholic, and um, a lot of those stories in there seemed to be almost horror stories of rape and killing. And, and I couldn't really understand them. I, couldn't, I knew there were lessons from them. But, you know, I, deep in my heart, I always knew you, you don't rape, you don't kill. I mean, I felt like the stories weren't all that useful to me. But this book of the Buddha was giving me ideas of, okay, here's how you can clear your mind. Uh, here is what compassion is about, what it and can do for you and can do for others in your relationships. Um, it, it just had all these. So I think I read the book, either half the book or the full book that night. It stayed in and ordered food in and I started reading that and that that was a shift for me because I knew that I really wanted to get out I was um, they, they say that the basic tenet of being a human being is that it's suffering or we have a lot of suffering we have suffering and I knew I was suffering inside I knew I had a big wall against people I couldn't be in a good relationship I always felt very distant from people and very aloof but that wrestling business will make that happened to you too when you have people clamoring and even uh, calling you fake or trying to get a chop in on you or something like that thinking it's cute and um, and just being rude in general it, it, it was there was a lot of negativity to it and as I said a lot of the guys some, some were fun I had some great relationships don't get me wrong there but a lot of the guys in the locker rooms were really sarcastic really rude and one of the fellas I talked to he had an interview and they said what would you be doing if you were um if you weren't wrestling you said well i'd either be in jail or i'd be in a rock and roll band or i'd be dead and i was thinking nice options 
<laughs> yeah, that should convince you to maybe uh, look at your future. Yeah, yeah, and start looking within and and see. Uh, but it's really hard when the world is that material to you. And, and I had more money than I knew what to do with in my 20s. I didn't make millions or anything, but I made a fair amount. And so everything's superficial. Everything's material. And you're buying almost whatever you want at a young, uh, immature age and don't have the wisdom to, to take a look. You know, I wish I had the wisdom now. But then again, at this point with my psychology, I would never get involved in that business. So That's right. I mean. We always are, are on the right path, even though we don't know it. And yeah. uh, you know, the nice thing about wisdom is looking back and say, "Oh, gee, I wish I could have told that to my 17-year-old self. I would have, you know, it would have been a lot easier." But it wasn't supposed to be easy. So here you are. You're reading all these books, these stories about the uh, about the Buddha, but there's a lot of suffering going on there, and a lot of uh, negativity, which is like your what you were experiencing in wrestling. So. How, how did you find the, the light in what was being said? Was it from the from the meditation aspect or the going inside and the stillness or what helped you turn the corner there? Well, for me, I think everything is twofold and I've practiced both. I've gone to, I, I tried, when I came back to Calgary, I started reading books on Taoism and Hinduism, yoga philosophies, not the yoga, just the exercise or the asanas, but the eight limbs of yoga and, and all these different studies I, I love the ideas, um, and then I fell upon this certain lineage of, uh, it's called Kadampa Buddhism, and it's close to the Dalai Lamas, but it's got its differences, and it really spoke to me, and this girl that I had known, actually from the from the bars I bounced at in between wrestling tours, she said, you've got to come and see Punsag, this monk, you, you've got to come, and I said, yeah, okay, okay, and um, then I saw her again, and she was teaching yoga, and she says, you've got to come, you love it, so... I finally went, and it was kind of funny because he had these big, huge glasses, and he was this skinny little East Indian guy who was throwing his robe over, and uh, and he had big eyes, too, underneath these glasses. And, um, because I was still sort of shifting, still being very judgmental, I, I thought, wow, this guy's kind of weird. You know? I don't know if I, I like this too much. It's uncomfortable. Because he would stare and he'd smile across the room with this big, beautiful smile. But it was a different kind of a smile. It was, it came from the inside and it's something I'd never really seen or felt before. And the lessons were great because he used analogies like attachment to haagen ice cream or attachment to Pizza Hut. <laughs> and so he gave us the really great ideas of what our modern society, how that works rather than just the ancient philosophies. But uh, to get back to the point, I believe that meditation and philosophy have to go hand in hand. I've been to other temples as well, where you just stare at a wall, they give you a little bit of information, but stare at the wall, meditate for an hour. And I can do that. Uh, personally, I don't get a lot out of that. And I didn't at the time. And I tried going there two or three times and just didn't get much fulfillment or really any knowledge out of it. So. And, and I also think that, you know, being left brain or right brain, some people are going to pick up on it easier than others. And the philosophies really spoke to me. And, uh, again, talking about non-attachment or talking about compassion and empathy, which uh, in my teen years, in my 20s in wrestling, I didn't know what compassion meant. It, it was all me. It was all self-centeredness. And so that was a real awakening for me. And I always felt like a pressure cooker inside because of that business. And, uh, it was very stressful. It was, you know, you, if you forget to duck the clothesline or you don't hear the guy say duck, you get your nose plastered all over your face. I broke my ankle. I broke my neck. You know, um, very easy to get injured. So that was high stress. And there's no take two in wrestling. It's all live. So unlike a TV show, you, if you make a mistake, you can do it over again. You can't make mistakes. And if you make a little mistake, you have to cover it up quickly. And so that right. was pressure. Yeah. And I realized that I was stressed, I was wired, I was shaky all the time. And these were internal things that I would felt but didn't really know how to put into words until I started studying Eastern philosophies. And they had terms like shempa, which is the negative charge that we have, negative emotional charge. And then again, compassion and empathy and compassion for self, which um, I was a bit of a perfectionist. And again, in that business, you kind of had to be. But uh, I was raised as a perfectionist too. So nothing was ever really good enough. And 
and you have to try really, really hard, and it's always got to be 100% um, and, and real intensity. And so I was a pretty intense person, and I, I knew it was, wasn't healthy for me. And I knew right. I was going to up and get kind of crazy and bang my head off a locker, do a bunch of push-ups, and go burst through the doors to pounding music and thousands of people. But I didn't know how to do the opposite. I didn't know how to calm myself down. And it was something I was really looking for. Wow. Now, so how did you find how did you find a, a way to calm down? Well, I started realizing um, really deep philosophies. Uh, so the meditations were all different meditations. So I hear people say to me when I coach them, "Well, I tried meditation online; it didn't work." Well, from what I understand, or my opinion is that it was probably the wrong meditation in the first place, maybe too advanced or off topic, whatever it may be. So he would take us through different topics and guide us through the meditation verbally and take us to these new and wonderful deep places within ourselves and to be able to see things outside and find a space of peace and calm at the end of them. And the key thing being is he would always say, now take that space and carry it on into your day. And that's what I do with my coaching clients as well, because if we can just meditate for a bit, um, just for example, I was dating a girl years ago and she was a yoga instructor and she said, I got them to meditate and calm down for five minutes. And I just smiled and went along with it. That's nice. But as soon as they get in traffic, they're flipping the bird off at the other person who just cut them off and screaming and yelling in traffic. So do you want to live like that? Right. And my answer is no, I don't want to live like that. Yeah, so you end up with a yin yang life. You have the quiet and the meditation, then you go back to the way you were, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that's not really what you're looking for. So, how how was this uh, person that you were working with and studying with? Was he Tibetan? He was actually Indian. Yeah. He was a Tibetan lineage, and okay. yeah, and he had learned from his teacher who wrote um, "Joyful Path of Good Fortune," which is a a thick book. That's the second book, which if a person were to pick it up and try to read it, it, you almost can't comprehend it. It just, it's so out of this world. But when you've gone through um, How to Solve Our Human Problems, which is a thinner book, and it talks about more of uh, what us normal people, lay people would do in our lives and how we could use these, carrying that space of peace and calm into our job and right. having people feel it. So... It, it made more sense to people coming in as beginners and learning how to use these things. And you don't have to go into a cave and hide and practice until you get enlightenment. Right. So, so what are these uh, five steps to crush stress? Well, I believe first of all, again, it's just like anything else, uh, uh, addiction or alcoholism that you have to admit that you have a problem. And, it can be mind racking at that point because if, and, and especially uh, I find with men, with myself, uh, my younger years, with a lot of men that have pretty high powerful jobs, high paying jobs, we're taught to be tough and not to admit that there's a problem. And that's a problem because if you're really, really stressed out, then these same men end up having heart attacks in their 40s or 50s and high blood pressure, et cetera. It's a huge problem. Yeah, I would imagine that the life expectancy of a, a world wildlife, you know, world wildlife, but a, a wrestler would be the world wildlife. I like that. How's that <laughs> first? Uh, would be fairly short. I mean, after all that punishment to the body and, that, you know, having to lead, live in that ego grandizement, for most of them uh, that didn't have this opportunity to have this turnaround, you know, where they had to discover their spirituality, I think it would be, quite stressful afterwards. I mean, all your glory is gone, and where do you go from there? We think that that could lead to really deep depression and possibly even suicide and early death. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got, I can count off the top of my head 20 different guys who uh, overdosed uh, on painkillers, sleeping pills, alcohol, um, suicides, uh, all kinds of awful, awful things. And it really is hard to change. I think you have to, again, really realize, and, and when I do a seminar, I talk about the recognition point, And I try to pound that into people of 
recognizing, okay, I do feel like a pressure cooker. So, and yes, I do have to do something about that if I want to feel good in life. And that's in very simple terms, uh, when we compare that to suffering, feeling good in general is, is the answer. And um, the, the way also to do that, though, along with the philosophies, which will tell you that if you're grasping, mentally clinging or grasping onto a person or a situation or a thing, that it's going to cause tension and it's going to cause bad moods and irritation, frustration, um, anger, all these different negative emotions, these shempas. Uh, right. Plus meditation, then you're going into alpha brainwave state. So as we're speaking right now, it's beta brainwave state. And you go into a deeper state, and it naturally calms you. Your, your heart rate slows down. Your physiology literally changes. Scientists have proven it with the prods on people's heads and watching the brainwaves on the screen that alpha brainwave is quite different. And then combining the philosophies, I really believe in guided meditations, especially at first. Then a person can ask, okay, I've got this problem. I've got this big, big problem. And, of course, every problem begins within the mind. And uh, I was in two car accidents before, one when I was wrestling, and um, this guy had been cutting me off in traffic, and so I went and cut him off with my aggression, and uh, I finally had stopped my truck in front of him on an off-ramp, and I was ready to beat him up, which I'm not, not proud to say at this point in time, but back then that was the case, and I was saying, get out of your car, and he was like, no, I'm not kidding, because I was 290 pounds at the time, yeah. and I'm glad that happened that way. But years later, I got into another car accident, and I've been practicing and meditating. And I, very, it happened, and I was very calm. And I thought, well, as because of my compassion and a practice called exchanging self with others, I thought, well, is he okay? And am I okay? And right. we'll have to get this fixed. But I had this this sense of, uh, well, you're you're still shaken up, but a certain sense of serenity through it all. Right. And what a better way to live life than, you know, going ballistic or getting really angry uh, about things, anything, in fact. So if we go back to the, the, the Tibetan steps to crush stress, the first one that you said was that you have to really realize that you're addicted, like addicted to anything. You're addicted to stress and you're, you're writing on your hormones. That was uh, step one was recognition. I'm not sure if you were the step two was learning how to deal with your emotions as they arise. It was is that step two? I would say that's step three. I think step two would be you know a willingness to learn how to change, of not wanting to be in that state anymore. But then that's not enough because as regular human beings, we're conditioned so deeply and raised to even see uh, my parents, for instance, would scream and yell when they got angry. I didn't want to be in that state in my 40s. Um, you know, you see different things uh, or, or to shut up because when we repress and we press anger or stress, then it's going to burst out sideways anyways. And typically the two things that I learned growing up from, from watching TV, or teachers, family, anything, we either repress or we explode. Right. And I didn't really know any different ways. So how do you go – as the average person, how do you go from, I don't want to do that anymore, to how do I not do that anymore? So then it's seeking information. So that's the third step is be, no, the seeking information? The second step is seeking information. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, and whatever resonates best with you. I mean, for some people, it's visiting a shaman. Um, some people, it, it is meditation. Um for some people, it's hypnotherapy or, or seeing a psychologist or anywhere where you can get information. You know, they say that we have all the information we need within. Quite possibly we do, but it could take us till the day we're dead to figure it out. <laughs> Why not speed it up a little bit, go out there, find out some really intelligent information. And uh, in these studies I took, they're called Lo Jong, which means the training of the mind and step-by-step -step procedures of, of how to get out of anger. And uh, I realized so over a couple of years that, you know, we, we get a little older, we get a little more mature, we're in a workplace, we're not allowed to get angry. So well, then what do we do? And then we get resentment against somebody else, and we hold on to it. Or we get irritable, 
and that's just the the cellular zappy feeling of being irritated that doesn't go away for hours no hormonal changes as you mentioned um, is a nasty feeling and, and it's again wanting to feel good rather than that so to find out the information and the steps okay now there's the next step is i realize i'm getting angry isn't that interesting or i realize i'm getting really frustrated or irritated and um, i'm a human being it's all part of the human condition i get frustrated i get irritated i would say I'll, I'll take a guess at 90 some percent of the time i can recognize it right off the bat though and um and that's through years and years of practice i've been doing this for 17 years so it doesn't happen right away but to notice that stress or or even anger or resentment etc that just starts to bubble up deep down in the subconscious mind um uh, and then an easier way for a lot of people is if you get the tension in your neck or the the broiling in your stomach or that rope around the sternum feeling that tightness and that tension going okay something's going on with my body so i think i'm getting angry or i'm getting resentful here and so that's that's that recognition point which really is what we're talking about here uh with stress right do we want to have the overwhelmed with that high energy frequency that's overwhelming or do you want to learn how to calm ourselves down with the five uh, Tibetan steps to crush st stress, uh, do we want to take control of our lives or do we want to be overwhelmed? And that's what we're talking to Rick about. So we're, I think we're at step number three, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to, to wrap the numbers up properly in my head because you mentioned it and now it's sort of zapped out. But I, I think we're talking about meditation and being able to find that space of peace and calm, going to alpha brainwave state. And yeah, absolutely. That's uh, it's a huge, huge thing. Uh, my the clients that I've worked with who've never meditated before or practiced and found these fairly useless information or useless meditations are just wow afterwards. I mean, a lot of people, men or women, are end, end up crying tears of joy at the end of it. Who would typically don't cry over things like that because it is such a beautiful space of peace to finally be able to consciously control that within your own body and your own mind and go to a space, uh, again, being a little bit advanced to your space that maybe not at the beginner's level, but later on that we would call emptiness. And so in this fast paced world, and there's the other part, let's, let's say this is number four, in this fast paced world that we have, we have traffic, we have uh, a lot of people have quotas at jobs, deadlines, um, people pushing us for certain things or things breaking down and you've got to get them fixed fairly quickly. We've got a really, really fast paced world. And also looking at the politics and even a little bit of a nuclear scare there for a while with Korea and the US, we've got all these things in our mind um, and, and so speedy and people come home and they can't stop. And this is actually something I find a little bit more with my female clients is that they'll come home and they'll clean and they'll cook and they'll and all these things are necessary, of course, but they'll do it just to keep busy because they don't know what else to do because then they, they feel like they're going crazy in their minds if they just try and practice stillness and, and rest up and uh, come to a nice peaceful state and slow everything down. And... And it is a hard practice, especially if you lived a fast paced lifestyle and had a lot of success with that in uh, martial arts In I really think it has to be that way. Uh, it might be a little bit of getting older too. It might be uh, changing vocations. It might be you finally realize in relationships as I did that it's cooperation that will make you more successful. And just like uh, your show or my podcast, cooperation of, of guests and more and more people cooperating to want to be part of that and, and spreading the word. You can't do it all on your own, something I, I learned years ago as well. And you know, I, think um, really important. I mean, I think we all way back in the 70s, I was interviewed uh, um, in Vancouver by the province and I found myself saying the next evolutionary step for humanity is to learn to live in community and of course in those days it was intentional community but 
it can be a community of spirit or a community of fellowship or a community of like-minded people. Mm-hmm. But I, th- I really do agree with you that collectively, uh, there's so much that we can learn by working collaboratively together. Absolutely. Yeah. And so if we go to number five, it's to be able to call upon that space of peace and calm. Let's just say we take three deep breaths right now, just to calm the body, relax the neck, and chill out a little bit. And meditation can last for half an hour or an hour or 20 minutes, whatever you like. But if you were to meditate every day and another deep breath, in this relaxed state, we can practice stillness. And beyond stillness, we can be very conscious. If Even if we are making dinner, I've had the honor of watching a Japanese tea ceremony before. And very conscious movement and the beauty of it. And if we were to practice that consciousness in our movements and our speech and interacting with other people, we're coming from this, we're emanating the space of peace and calm. And to be able to call upon that, uh, at first it's really difficult. And it takes a lot of practice and creating new neural pathways in the brain because we've got these other old ones, these speedy ones from decades and decades of living life that way and TV telling us to be that way. And... Um, Again, sports and quotas and all these really hard-pushing things in lives. Once we could breathe and calm down like this, well, imagine how difficult it would even be to pick up a gun. Yeah, it becomes inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And that's a space that comes from within. And if you can feel that space, and again, to carry that space into your life after the meditation... And it used to be for me where I could carry it for five minutes or I could carry it for a half an hour. I was working at a health club and we had quotas and there was a lot of pressure. Um, one particular girl that worked with me and, and she would run up to my desk first thing as I was, I was manager there. Rick this, Rick that, Rick this. First thing in my morning at nine o'clock. And I said, you've got to tone this down a little bit here because, you know, and, and, and uh, but she kept doing it. And that's the challenge of, they say the lesser vehicle or the greater vehicle. So the the lesser vehicle, again, going and getting the information, practicing the meditations, going into a cave on your own and trying to find enlightenment, the, the greater vehicle being the larger one is emanating that sense of peace and calm and bringing others into your space. And, and or even if other people are peeking out or panicking to be able to maintain that space, and you might get drawn in and drawn out, but as long as you're conscious of your own inner space, which again is a real practice, you can pretty much maintain it. And I, I like the idea of emotional equanimity, you know, just to not, not too many waves, not flat line, not being like a zombie. I have a lot of female clients who say, well, Rick, I don't want to be a, like a zombie or I don't want to be a robot. Again, it's part of the human condition. We're going to have emotions. That's why we have to practice these things so we don't get the extreme emotions and I know I lived in peaks and valleys. And you mentioned depression. I was depressed after my wrestling career. I had all these highs and all these peaks. And even after a really great match, it would be a crash afterwards. So it messes with your brain. It messes with your hormonal systems, everything else. And with normal jobs or having kids, any daily life that, that anybody would have, they often live in peaks and valleys. Uh, emotional struggles in in love relationships, things like this. And to be able to find that space of peace and calm and practice that emotional equanimity, which, you know, you're going to get these peaks and these valleys here and there. That's normal. It's not failure. But if the majority of the time is kind of like this, just a bit wavy, you feel so good inside and you can share that with others. Well, we got one more. Okay, great. (laughs) I think it's practicing happiness. And I, again, with all these techniques, um, I mentioned one earlier about mentally grasping or clinging and recognizing that we're grasping or clinging onto a person, place, or thing. And then while in meditation, to let go of that or let go of the grip a little bit and to go even deeper, grasping onto our eye, as you said in the lineage that I studied, 
We use our I, we could call it ego in English. Um, but what is my I? What, what is my me? Who am I? And realizing that we're a soul and that this is just, a, as they say, a meat sack or a vehicle and it's temporary and everything is impermanent in our life. And that can come across as a little bit morbid sometimes if we think, well, I'm going to die and this car is going to break. But that's, that's the true nature of life is that nothing lasts forever. And to understand on with a sense of peace and calm that everything is impermanent. So the relation problems, the relationship problems that you might have or a job loss that you might have or financial loss, it, that's all impermanent. And that's really nice to think too. And again, with, with the highs, I mean, we do have our ego attached to it. We do have, uh, as John D. Martini from The Secret, we have overexcitement and elation. We peak out too high. And then, of course, there's only one way to go after that, to, to be able to temper that and, and live on a more even keel. And that's what we talk, we talk about, um, that equanimity and, and balance, inner balance in our world and being able to carry say, who is Rick or who are you to your relationship or your job or who are you at your core and maintaining that instead of always having to put on a mask. Yeah, no more masks. We'll leave those to the wrestling federations, right? No <laughs> more masks. We, we want to show up and be authentic, uh, take That's back right. our personal power and stand in our truth. And you've given some great techniques about how to do that. So I know that uh, you'll have a link in uh, show notes uh, from this uh, interview. I think you're offering a, a link to a meditation that you take people through to give people a sense of what your meditation uh, that you use in your coaching. Is that correct? Yeah, if they want to wrestle, uh, wrestle me. <laughs> if you want to yeah, wrestle you. Yeah, that, no, we don't want to wrestle you. <laughs> if you want to email me at rick at ricktitan.com, I can send out the the let go meditation. So it's, and what I did was I took a lot of these over the years. Uh, when I first started speaking publicly about uh, a lot of these techniques, it was way over people's heads. And I had a couple of people come up to me afterwards and they were good friends. And they said, Rick, we couldn't even understand some of the things you're talking about. And so I toned it down a little bit, tried to use more English terms. And then I had gone to Toastmasters and uh, Iris Talbot, this great lady, she said, why don't you start using some acronyms for some of the meditations so it's easier because mental attachment doesn't mean anything to the majority of the population, and they just can't grasp it. It doesn't make sense to them. I said, okay, well, <clears throat> letting go is a big part of non-attachment to things, right. and it gives us this great sense of peace to let go of things in the past, and... Um, I've created one that's called the let go meditation. So the L is to look deep inside and while you're in meditation and I, uh, at the beginning of the audio that I offer, I, I guide people through the breathing process and I keeping the spine straight and to take so many deep breaths and to relax on the exhale, to get them in the state and then to look deep inside about what's really bothering you. Because this is another key thing is, a lot of times we're irritated, frustrated, stressed to the gills, and we don't even know why. Yeah, we can't right. figure it out. You know, what's going on with me? I'm so, for a week now, I've been snappy with people in this way and that way. Well, if we meditate and keep the practice on a regular basis, just like going to the gym, as we were talking about earlier, because once you quit, the, the positive effects, they dwindle, and then they're not even there anymore if you don't keep practicing. Uh, to yeah, isn't that the truth? I mean, that is so true is that whether it's going to the gym or whether it's meditation or learning how to clear yourself or taking back your power, this is a lifelong endeavor. This is not something, oh, well, I've done that, been there, got the t-shirt, I'm done, right? This mm -hmm. is something that we continue to do. Well, I love what you are saying. And so you help people move through their stress and duress. You help them find their center of calmness. You work with all, it sounds like you work with males and females yes. to help them in this time of transformation. Do you get a chance to work with any uh, people that have a wrestling background? Yeah, a couple, a couple. Um, right. Yeah, it seems to me like uh, wrestlers and um, those that have, you know, veterans would really, really benefit from, you know, 
uh, from your experience as well. I mean, being a big guy, six five, and, and you know, a huge muscular guy, there's something about your presence that uh, ensures them that you know what you're talking about because you've been down there, the path that they, they've been down, and I think that that would give them some um, some sense that you can help them understand this transition for themselves. It it that's totally true. For whatever reason, though, I typically coach people that have very normal lives. And right. they're having trouble with um, getting over somebody passing away or a relationship breakup or uh, just being stressed and not knowing why. Very normal lives. So I, I think it may be the athlete's pride or something that prevents a lot of those types of people coming to me um, because it, it, I probably coach 80% female. And, yeah. and they're, again, I think – a lot of women are more open to admitting when they have a problem, discussing it and right. talking about it, where as a lot of men, because of societal stigma, are shut down and they don't want to admit to any weakness, and it's more difficult to work with, and it can be a little more like pulling teeth sometimes. But right. just to run down things really quickly, the, the E for let go is to explore deep inside. So you sort of pinpoint in your subconscious mind what it is that's bothering you so you can get it detailed. And then you can work on it. You can bring it to light. The T is to transfer that negative emotion or that shempa outside of you and keep practicing removing that and moving that, that again, uh, feeling of a rope around your sternum or turmoil in the stomach or tension in the neck, headaches, etc. To be able to remove that and be very conscious and aware of it, the G is to gray it out. So imagining what your first lunchroom and chair and table arrangement looked like at your first job maybe even as a teenager or your first date that you ever had what's their eye color what do their teeth look like a lot of times we can't remember it's fogged in our memory so i call it grayed out it can be something that happened two weeks ago but if we practice that graying out process over and over and over again something from two weeks ago can feel like it happened 20 years ago which is a great feeling of release and then the O is to make an order to the universe. And I used to make it so that if it was a relationship, okay, well, what's your ideal mate? And still once in a while do that. But really the order to the universe for me has gotten so much bigger. And I think it's helped my clients a lot more in that it's to find that space of peace and calm and be able to maintain it. And as I mentioned, after the meditation throughout your day, it'll get better. It could be five or 10 minutes for the first while then you can maintain it for an hour. Then maybe you'll bubble up later in the day, have it for another hour. And after a while, again, it's taken me years, but I maintain my space of peace and calm pretty much all day long unless I feel really – I've had a few political situations over the last little while where it got my shempa pretty good, but then I would practice my own, my own meditations. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the world wants to or life wants to – you know, test us to see whether we really can be in the zone, right? Whether we can really uh, dwell there and how long can you dwell? And when you think you're there and, and permanently, then you'll get a nice test to, to see whether you can stay there with a, with a normal, you know, fast curveball from life itself. But yeah. I love that your approach, I, I love the fact that your technique works right across, um, you know, from all levels of society and and for even those that, you know, have had major stress and trauma in their lives. So, you know, if anybody's listening to this show and you've had post-traumatic stress or you had a wrestling background or you, you know, or you're a veteran and you're trying to work through this stuff and don't know how to do it. And uh, because you're a strong alpha male, I just want you to know that here's another alpha male who learned how to do it. And um, turn to somebody that you can trust who comes from the same background as you that to help you make this bridge for yourself to to find your true nature of who you are, find that peace and calm inside of yourself and find your way home back to the light. Rick, thank you ever so much. This was, was a wonderful interview. I love the fact that, you know, you've done this turnaround in your life. You're a living proof of that. You can take anything and change it around and learn from it and then turn around and from your experience be able to help others do it. So what's the last words you'd like to leave with everybody on the show today? Well, Besides first of, all, all of you. first of all, thank you, Tyson, for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. And what I'd like to leave people with is that if you don't know how to find a way, but you realize you're having some real internal challenges, 
then seek away and keep trying. Don't stop trying. And, and find a teacher, uh, at least read some books, get some new information that you never had before because the old information is gonna keep you stuck where you are. And if it's that pressure cooker feeling inside like I had, or if it's that, that shaky hand, type A, super driven type of a, a personality or psychology that you wanna to learn to temper or calm down, or even just relax in your own free time, there are ways of doing that, but you have to go and find and learn them and practice right. them. So one more time, how do people get to work with you, Rick? Well, uh, I, I work on Skype. I can work on phone calls uh, in Calgary here. I work out of an office as well, so one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we do packages so that it's not as pricey and... Um, Probably the best way to get a hold of me is rick at ricktitan.com, and then we can go on the phone from there, see if things are fit in the match, because as I mentioned earlier, some certain places or even people don't quite resonate or fit completely together. Uh, that would be the first first part of the sort of a phone interview back and forth. All right. So thank you ever so much for showing up on the show. And for everybody listening to the show, be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. For quality online wellness products, courses, and services, visit our sponsors, thewellnessstore.ca and the Extraordinary Healing Arts Academy located at thewellnessacademy.ca. To stay in touch, visit us at thewellnessshow.ca. And until next time, be healthy, wealthy, and wise.